Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly web series all about geometry processing, which aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. And every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And today, we're here to have Hong Lin Chen as our opener to talk about quadratic decomposition or spectral coarsening, and Adriana Schultz as our headliner to talk about programming languages for design and fabrication. We're encouraged to ask any question at YouTube chat. And let's begin by welcoming our opener, Hong Lin Chen. She is a master's student at University of Toronto, advised by David Aven. She has received her Bachelor of Engineering in Computer Science and Technology from Zhejiang University. While doing her bachelor's degree, she has received a first-class academic scholarship where only top 5% in academic performance is recognized. She also has done an industrial internship at Microsoft Research Asia. I have witnessed her genuine effort on her research to be finalized on this year's CGRAF Asia, which will be the top topic today. Note that she is also looking for a PhD position, and she's a great host of our weekly lab meeting a uh, mother of hamsters, protector of spectral properties, uh, and let's give a warm welcome to Hong Lin. You can take it away. Thanks, Sanbei. So let me just share my screen. Is that looks all right? Yeah. So today I will talk about our recent work about color decomposition of spectral coarsening. And this is a joint work with Derek Liu, Alec Jacobson, and David Lemming of the University of Toronto. Discrete operators are everywhere in computer graphics. And one of their key properties is the spectral properties, namely the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. However, when defined on a high resolution domains, those matrices and their spectral properties are computationally expensive to use. And coarsening one solution to this problem has become an extensively studied topic in computer graphics and machine learning, with the aim of preserving different geometric and physical properties under decimations. Recent methods show that it's possible to simplify a discrete operator while preserving its spectral properties. The state of the art is Liu and colleagues' work in 2019 on spectral coarsening, and Les Cos and colleagues' work on spectral mesh simplification. The closest one to our work is Liu and colleagues' work in 2019. However, their method has no sparsity control of the coarsen matrix and results in a denser operator. In contrast, our method allows the user to freely control the sparsity pattern. Moreover, their method uses a non convex formulation, thus, their gradient descent may not converge to the global optimum, whereas our method successfully formulates the problem as a convex optimization. So, why is sparsity control so important? On the one hand, a sparser matrix means less computation cost, and thus, it's faster. On the other hand, a denser matrix has more degrees of freedom and may better preserve the spectral properties. Our sparsity control allows for a trade-off between the spectral accuracy of the operator and the cost of its application. So next, I will talk about spectral coarsening, which enables us to significantly reduce the size of a discrete operator while preserving its spectral properties at the lowest frequency. Then the question comes, how can we measure the spectral similarity between two operators of different sizes? The state of the art minimizes the commutative energies, which can be understood as follows. Intuitively, if the coarsen operator X preserves the spectral properties of the original operator L, then given some function phi on the original domain, first applying the original operator L and then restricting the function to the coarsen domain where R, should be the same as first restricting the function while R, and then applying the coarsen operator X. Finally, because the operator we consider here are usually defined on some irregular domain, such as on a triangle mesh, we also need to weight the formulation by their mass matrices. 
When phi are the eigenfunctions, we can prove that minimizing the commutative energies also preserve the eigenvalues. And because discrete operators like Laplace also have some other properties, for example, the matrix needs to be sparse and symmetry positive semi definite. So we also added those two constraints here. If you write it into the form of an optimization problem, then we have the commutative energies as our energy functions and two constraints. One is that the Coulson operator must be positive semi-definite, and the other is that the Coulson operator must have a specific sparsity pattern. The sparsity pattern E can be any arbitrary sparsity pattern. It can encode your surface or volumetric mesh connectivity, graph connectivity, or even some other random connectivity. However, it's really tricky to, tricky to satisfy both the PSD constraint and the sparsity constraint at once. Suppose we want to project a dense matrix with an arbitrary sparsity pattern to positive semi-definite. Standard way of doing this is to clamp all the negative eigenvalues to zero. However, because the eigenvectors are dense, the resulting matrix after the PSD projection will also be dense. If we want to project the dense PSD matrix back to its original sparsity pattern, then the resulting matrix may not be positive semi-definite. So how do we project a matrix with an arbitrary sparsity pattern to positive semi-definite while still maintaining its sparsity pattern? And the answer to this is codal decomposition. Typically, the sparsity pattern of a matrix can be represented by a graph. And a graph is codal if every cycle of length greater than length 3 has a chord. The reason why the codal graph is so special is that it can be easily decomposed into smaller graphs. Because of these properties, we can use codal decomposition to split a large sparse PSD constraint into multiple small PSD constraints. So let's look at our optimization problem again. Using the codal decomposition, we can now decompose our large sparse PSD constraint into several small ones, which are cheaper and parallelizable. However, not every graph is a codal graph but we can always add new edges to make a non codal graph codal. In terms of matrix, this is equivalent to adding non-zero entries or degrees of freedom into the original sparsity pattern. But what we want is the original sparsity pattern. However, we can always add new edges or inequality constraint to enforce the new degrees of freedom arising from the extension to be zeros. So let's look at our optimization problem again. For any symmetry sparsity pattern E, we can use codal extension to extend it to a codal sparsity pattern and add zero constraint to enforce the new degrees of freedom arising from the extension to be zeros. Our zero constraint enforces at a particular new filling entries, the sum of the projected dense matrix must equal zero, not that each dense matrix must contribute a zero value to that entry. And this is a convex optimization problem because the energy function is quadratic and that's convex. With a change of variables, the codal sparsity pattern constraint can be formulated as only using the non-zero entries in X as the optimization variables. And the next two constraints are both linear constraints and the final PSD constraint made the problem become a semi-definite programming. So to recap, we formulate a spectral coarsening problem into a convex optimization, where we use codal decomposition to decompose a large sparse PSD constraint into several small ones. Then we efficiently optimize this problem using ADMN, or the alternating direction method of multipliers. In ADMN, we iteratively optimize the global variable X and the local variable ZI. Each global update is a single linear solve and can be pre-computed. And each local update is a set of small PSD projection and can be parallelized. Finally, let's look at our results. First, in order to measure how well the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues in the high resolution domains are maintained by its course and counterparts, we visualize the functional map from Liu 2019. The optimal functional map should be a diagonal matrix with one and minus one on its diagonal. 
We also show the Laplacian commutative norms and the orthogonality norm proposed by Les Cold and colleagues to quantify the spectral preservations. The smaller the two norms are, the better the spectral preservation is. So first we show that using the sun steering sparsity pattern, our convex formulation enables our ADMN solver to converge to a better results on shape where the gradient descent in the 2019 may struggle to converge. Here we can see that our functional map is more diagonal. Our method can also handle an isotropy operator where the standard simplification scheme may fail entirely due to the anisotropic. Our optimization scheme enables the user to freely choose between the one ring and three ring sparsity pattern. In contrast, Liu 2019 has much less sparsity control and only allows for steering sparsity pattern, which introduces a significant amount of new viewings. With sparsity control at hand, we can balance between the spectral accuracy of the operator and the cost of, of its applications. Increasing the non-zeros in the sparsity pattern will allow for more degrees of freedom, which enables our solver to converge to a better result. And using the one stand one ring sparsity pattern, our approach could also further improve the results from the spectral simplification while post-processing. Here we visualize the bihamonial distance. Our sparsity control also enables novel applications. We show that our approach can optimize the Laplacian of a surface only mesh with random distance connection to approximate the spectral behavior of a volumetric mesh. Here, the edge links are visualized as the gray lines in the right. We visualize the bihamonial distance of our optimized surface Laplacian, where the source vertices are visualized as the green dots in the back. We can see that our bihamonial distance is much closer to the volumetric one than the surface Laplacian. We also visualize the functional map and the sparsity pattern of our optimized surface Laplacian. Our modified surface Laplacian is sparse and with a controllable sparsity pattern, while, while the corresponding matrix has to be dense in the traditional boundary element method. Here we show one more example of our, our volume to metric, our volume to surface approximations. And finally, I would like to thank the following funding agencies and my co-authors without who this paper can be possible. And thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much for this great talk, Hongnin. Um, we will have a, a joint Q and A after the headliner talk, but I encourage you to post questions as you come up with it, or we'll keep checking on it. And thank you again for uh, this great question on EV seven seven S four F. We will make sure to have that question at the end of the talk. Uh, and then let's proceed by um, by welcoming our headliner, Adriana Schultz. Adriana Schulz is an assistant professor at uh, the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington, where she is a member of Computer Graphics Group. She is a co-director of the Digital Fabrication Center. She is also a director of uh, WeGraph, which stands for Women in Graphics Research. I encourage you to visit the WeGraph ORG website and follow them on social media which we just posted on the YouTube chat. Their goal is to broaden the network of women researching computer graphics. Coming back to Adriana, she was selected as an innovator under 35 in this year. And you can check her amazing five minutes introduction on her works at her, home, her homepage. I also encourage you to check it out. So without further ado, let's welcome Adriana Schultz. Okay, well, thank you so much for uh, the very nice introduction. Um, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, yeah, so you know, using this <laughs> as a little bit of an advertisement, uh, this is our website for WeGraph. I highly encourage you um, to, to look it up, uh, follow us on 
social media. We have Twitter, we have Facebook. Uh, you can also sign up for emails. We don't spam you because we're very busy. <laughs> Uh, we're all researchers just trying to um, create resources uh, that would be helpful. So we have, you know, we post different uh, scholarships and fellowships that are available uh, for, you know, different uh, stages of, of a researcher in graphics career, uh, which uh, we have some spotlights uh, uh, discussing some, you know, uh, great news in our area. And of course, we have events and conferences. Uh, so, um, yeah, please. Uh, as, uh, help us uh, spread the word. Um, okay, so um, today I want to talk to you about programming languages for uh, design and fabrication. Uh, but let me start by first uh, giving you a brief introduction. Is this better? Um, let me start by first uh, giving you a brief uh, introduction of uh, the work that I do. Uh, so in my group, uh, we do research on computational design for manufacturing. So we're excited about uh, what we call this, you know, people are calling this next manufacturing revolution, right? So there's tremendous progress in manufacturing hardware. So 3D printers, industrial robots, you know, whole garment knitting machines, right? And all these tools uh, point towards a revolution on what are the types of objects that we can make Right? And who can make this objects? We can have batch of one production of designs that have unprecedented complexity and functionality. So the question that my group tries to address is, well, what should the future design tools for manufacturing be? If we want to enable this new complexity of designs, right? what are the tools for, uh, um, for design that will come together uh, with the manufacturing hardware in order to enable this next manufacturing revolution. Um, and we address uh, this question in different ways. So first we say, well, you know, design tools should be intelligent to allow a user to create an object that will not only be a geometry that looks, that can be rendered, but also a complete fabrication plan uh, that tells you how you build that object. Right, uh, and this tool should guide the users that maybe don't have expertise in exactly how these objects should be made, or so that they can create a functional design. Um, or does, uh, uh, design should also be driven by how these objects are going to perform, how they're going to behave once they're part of the physical world. So, are these objects stable? Are they durable? What are the different uh, objectives that they need to have, and how do you trade off these different objectives in a reasonable way? We also look at design optimization across multiple domains. So for example, if you're trying to design a robot, of course you care about the geometry of this robot, but you also need to design the gate um, so that the object performs as desired by the user. And again, the output of the system would be a complete fabrication plan, which includes both the geometry that will be 3D printed and the software to be loaded into the microcontroller. And finally, we look at not only optimizing the geometry, the shape, Right, of the design, uh, but also how this design is going to be executed uh, using different fabrication processes. So either robots that can you know, bring pieces of lumbers to be cut, or if you're using, for example, a three axis machine, how, what is the right uh, tool path uh, that would make it uh, more efficient to create this design. Uh, so typically <laughs> when I'm invited to give talks, that is kind of what I talk about. I talk about this next manufacturing revolution how do you create design tools for manufacturing and kind of do a little bit of like, these are the, you know, are uh, the work uh, that our group is, is, is working on. I decided to do something a little bit different today. Uh, and the reason is because I really, really enjoy this colloquium uh, because I find that I always learn, you know, something specific and something new. Um, so I wanted to, uh, instead of giving you an overview of my work, tell you a little bit about a problem that I'm been recently been getting uh, into and getting very excited about, uh, which is programming languages applications uh, and the interface of programming languages and geometry processing. So uh, a lot of this is going to be kind of you know, ideas. I'll tell you a little bit about the, the work that we have started to do uh, and kind of you know, ideas we're looking forward. Um, so let me start by trying to motivate why I am excited about programming languages. Uh, 
Um, so programming languages have been used for a while in computational design, right? From um, constructive solid geometry to procedural modeling, uh, and even uh, recently uh, to be able to create uh, interesting math diagrams. Right? So the idea here is that by defining a DSL or domain specific language, we can generate complex designs from a small set of instructions. And this kind of methodology has been used extensively in computer-aided design. So most CAD tools nowadays, the way that they work uh, is you have this uh, IDE, this interactive interface where you're building a geometry bottom up. Uh, but at the end of the day, what is happening is you're really creating a program, right? Each of these features, you know, take, design the sketch, extrude, and so on and so forth, defines a program, right? Um, and this program is also parametric, right? It has a few uh, parameters, uh, for example, dimensions and so on, uh, that tell you how a model like this uh, can vary. And this parameterization is extremely interesting because it allows structured variations. So if you take a CAD program like this, the user can directly specify how they want the model to vary. So this, in this example, this is a fillet or a bevel, so the, the rounding of this, this, this corner, right? Um, and this is a radius that is one of the variables that is exposed by the user. I can also create a complex gear design where I have specific constraints uh, that are important for my functionality, but I can also leave other variables free uh, if I'm trying to do optimization. Or something like this, where I have a helical design of, of a lamp, right, where I have certain structures about how this helix should be. And these are, again, uh, controlled by the user. So these are variables of how the shape can change, but they are directly controlled by the user. Now, of course, in geometry processing, we have tons of amazing work on geometric variation. So they can take a given design, right, and tell you ways that you can manipulate the shape preserving structure. Um, and while these are, are, are really impressive uh, techniques, I would argue that there's something that is particular about using programming languages, uh, which is the level of control, right? There's specific types of variations that uh, you cannot achieve uh, just by looking at the geometry because the intent, right, of the user, that, you know, is not necessarily exposed in the geometry of one single design. Right? Uh, there are specific geometric relationships that we want to preserve and others that we do not want. Right? Uh, and you can't just infer that from heuristics. While in the program, you are actually able to, to do that in a meaningful way. Uh, so programs have this advantage of defining these structured variations. Another great advantage is of programs uh, is that they enable uh, inverse design. So a DSL defines right, what is the types of shapes that you can have. And then uh, that constrains a search space. So for example, for recognition applications. So these are some uh, examples of recent work where you have, for example, a sketch and you want to infer uh, a LaTeX code for drawing out these sketches, or you have a shape and you want to infer a program that generates uh, that 3D model for a construction. And then there's, of course, <laughs> the link to digital manufacturing, which uh, is something that personally excites me a lot. Um, so we were talking in the beginning about how my group uh, tries to address design problems for this new manufacturing revolution. And if you think about this new manufacturing revolution, it's really about digital manufacturing, which is uh, look at all of these types of devices, right? And they allow more freedom of form of what you can make. Uh, and they allow batch of one production. I would argue that digital manufacturing, really what it is, it boils down to the use of programmable abstractions to generate physical artifacts. So think, for example, of a 3D printer or a CNC milling machine, right? Instead of just having one operation that is constantly executed, they take in code. G code, um, and they execute the code to create a model. And by taking it a different code, they would generate a different model. And these programmable abstractions is what allows for this variability, for batch of one production, for this freedom. And uh, ultimately, right, uh, programmable abstractions uh, enable variation. 
And they enable variation both in designs, right? Since CAD systems are parametric from construction, and they enable variation also in fabrication. So state-of-the-art CAD tools and state-of-the-art fabrication tools are both represented with programmable abstractions, with code. Um, so a question that I think is interesting to ask is, well, can we use this insight, right, that both design and fabrication are programs to solve interesting problems in this domain uh, by drawing ideas from computer systems? So one of the most influential developments in computer architecture was the introduction of instruction set architectures, right, which is these ISAs, and they are an interface between software and hardware. Uh, and they, what have they, they've done in, in the past you know, few decades is enabled the independent development of both software and hardware. So we want to ask the question, well, can we do something similar for design and manufacturing? So this is kind of uh, the reasons why I think programming languages are exciting. So let me tell you a little bit of a, of a case study or a recent project from our group. So recently, we have tried to address this question in the domain of carpentry. Uh, so carpentry is an interesting domain because say, for example, you want to uh, design a shape like this right? um, or fabricate a shape like this. And there are many different ways that I can make this for house. I can use many different types of tools, right? A bandsaw, a jigsaw, a table saw, a chop saw. Right? And I can also use uh, different types of stock material. And then uh, for each of the parts, I can arrange these parts in different ways on the stock. And then I can decide how I am going to cut the stock also in different ways. And all of these decisions are going to impact the final fabrication costs of this part. So for example, in this here, one of these fabrication plans uh, can be done in less time. The other one has a smaller fabrication error based on how much you're stacking parts and uh, what uh, processes you're using. Uh, and the other one has less material costs and based on how you pack these parts. Um, and of course, searching this whole combinatorial space of uh, fabrication processes from a design is challenging. So here, what we do is we say, well, you know, our design is going to really just be represented as code, right? A sequence of instructions that tell me how I'm going to build this birdhouse. And fabrication can also be seen as code, a sequence of instructions that say, take a chop saw, set it up at a 30 degree angle, cut, right? And so we can then use ideas from compilers to go from a design to a fabrication. So we propose what we call Helm, which is our, these, uh, it's a hardware extensible languages for manufacturing. And we have two DSLs. We have a domain specific language for design, uh, which we call high level Helm, uh, and then a domain specific language for fabrication, which is low level Helm and a compiler to go from one to the other. Our high level Helm is inspired basically by CAD languages, right? So we have an IDE where the user can create a geometry and automatically as the user interacts uh, with the software, it outputs high level Helm code, which is the sequence of instructions, right? To build uh, this, this shape. Uh, so it's similar to CAD languages, uh, but it works in a subtractive way so that it maps directly to woodworking. So instead of doing extrusions and lofts, it will have operations like make stock, make a cut. And again, similar to CAD languages, it is parametric. So all of these uh, operations depend on parameters that it can then use for, as we discussed, structured variation. Another important aspect is that this language is not dense in the sense that you would be able to use a language like this to generate something that just doesn't work, right, or just is not possible to be manufactured. Um, and for this reason, we need to have a verifier uh, that is ensuring manufacturability. And this verifier is going to be part of our compiler. Um, and as the user interacts with the system, it has an interactive feedback loop. 
Now the fabrication uh, is going to be this uh, low level DSL and that now is process specific. Uh, so we would say if I, this is the part I want to make, you would say, well, if you're using a, a chop saw, you're setting it up a specific angle and then you're cutting a specific piece of lumber, a two by four. And because it's process specific, it needs to understand what are the types of processes, right? What are the kinds of tools that we have available? And for this reason, it's important to be designed so that it's extensible. So that we can uh, say, for example, now um, I decided to buy a jigsaw for my workshop, then I can add that to my, uh, uh, to my language as well, so that the compiler could decide between using the chop saw or the jigsaw to execute um, this design. So given these two DSLs, the high level and the low level, then the compiler is going to be converting a design to a fabrication domain. And again, as we said, it's going to uh, do a design validation and uh, then do the fabrication optimization. So the design validation is going to have to take into account what are the processes that the user has available in their workshop, uh, which we you know, do again with the IDE, the user simply has to select what are the kinds of tools that they have available and that is used for validation. And then of course the fabrication optimization is kind of the interesting little bit here, right? Um, because as we said, you know, what we need to do is decide between a long sequence of interdependent steps. We need to choose the types of materials we want to use. We need to then pack the parts, right? In uh, the different types of stock. Uh, and then we need to define also, right? How we're going to cut and the order of the cuts. And of course, this is a really large combinatorial space. So we're going to try to establish a data structure so that we can represent this in a meaningful way. The other challenge here is that there are multiple and conflicting fabrication costs. So for example, here for this design, right, here are two different fabrication plans. Uh, the one on the left is going to use less material, but then the one on the right is actually faster to fabricate. And that's because by using a little bit more material, you can arrange the stock in a way so that, that afterwards you can stack them and make a single cut um, uh, uh, that would you know, generate uh, multiple parts at the same time. Uh, so we don't actually want to find one optimal design. We want to find a series of uh, designs that are optimal in a meaningful way. Uh, so we're going to have to use a multi-objective optimization here. Uh, and just to recap, what I mean by multi-objective optimization is just that, you know, if we have you no know, time and material at two different objectives, right? I want to find not one optimal design, but a sequence, a series of designs that trade off these two objectives. So not every design is useful. So for example, if this is uh, the, uh, this uh, region is the region of possible designs, uh, this yellow point here is not a nice or useful design, right? Because I could get a design uh, that is, has exact same uh, fabrication time, but less material, right? Or I can have a design that has the same material cost, but can be executed in less time. The designs that I care about are the designs that do the optimal trade-offs, we call this the Pareto frontier, right? So the designs in the Pareto front are the ones that we care about and we want to extract them, all, all of the designs or many designs um, that are on this front. Uh, so this is what we want to do and these are the challenges. And so we look at uh, programming languages and said, well, can we learn uh, from um, the work that is done in programming languages and in compilers to solve these challenges. And it turns out there's a really cool idea called eGraphs or equivalence graphs. And they uh, basically what they do is they define a data structure uh, that makes this kind of search tractable. They have been extensively used uh, in compilers and theorem provers. And the way that I think is that uh, most intuitive uh, for us in computer graphics to understand is to think about expression simplification, which is something that a lot of us have done, right? Like you, you know, type your uh, expression in your favorite software and say, hey, simplify this for me. Um, what are they doing when, uh, when you ask uh, the software to do that for you? Uh, they basically think, well, there's, these are two different codes, right? This is a code. Uh, and 
the one on the left is equivalent to the one on the right because they have the same semantics. And I can go from the left to the right by applying a sequence of rewrite rules. What are these rewrite rules? Well, you know, in this case, you know, they would be associativity, commutativity, so on and so forth. And so by applying this sequence of rewrite rules, I can create a program that is more compact. And maybe compactness is my objective uh, for, you know, uh, that I want to, or size of the program is the objective that I want to optimize. Um, and of course, rewrite systems are challenging. And the reason why this is challenging is that even if you have a nice set of rewrite rules that you can apply, right, the order in which you're applying these rules matters. Um, because you can, otherwise you can get stuck. It's called a phase ordering problem. Um, and you want to make sure that you actually reach a good design. So an alternative thing that you could do is to look at uh, uh, this expression and try to represent a set of variations of this expression. So what are all of the programs that are equivalent? Represent all of them. And then once you have seen all of these enumerated in front of you, pick the optimal one. Of course, <laughs> doing something like this would not be tractable, but eGraphs allow you to represent these variations in a compact way. And that's why they're so useful. Uh, so to make this clear, let me show you what I mean and uh, within our application on our Carpentry compiler. So here's an example. Imagine that you have this design. Okay, uh, and it's a simple design. It's made of three different parts. I can uh, a program for many that says how I can manufacture this design could say, well, here I'm going to arrange all of these parts here in this um, uh, in one piece of lumber this way, right? And here's a manufacturing plan, which is actually equivalent to actually arranging uh, these pieces in the same uh, lumber. Right? Uh, but in a different order. And these are equivalent, so I'm going to say that they're in the same E class or the same equivalence class. But I could also generate this design uh, with uh, this, uh, uh, cutting this uh, part in a small piece of lumber, and then the other two parts in a large piece of lumber. And so the union of these two fabrication plans is also equivalent to the one here at the top. And then again, Right? Um, for the, uh, this child A class on the right, I can also express this as a union of this fabrica uh, fabricating each of the small parts in a small piece of lumber. Any uh, a term in this equivalence graph would be just you know, a path along this graph and it creates a program which is a complete fabrication plan. Why is this interesting? Well, this is interesting because now uh, we can represent many, many equivalence programs, equivalent programs in a very compact way. So here's an example where we have a small e-graph and uh, we can represent a, a more than 8,000 different programs or different fabrication plans, right? Uh, just from this one, uh, this uh, graph representation. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to use this idea of applying eGraph so that we can do efficient search, right? And then do uh, optimization of fabrication plans. But of course we can't just simply use uh, this idea directly in our domain. There's certain challenges uh, related to how uh, design and manufacturing works uh, that is not present in many of the PL applications that use eGraph. The first is the issue of linearity and linearity here in the programming languages sense, not as, a, <laughs> as the geometry think about it. Um, so linearity here means the reusability of variables. So common eGraphs applications, uh, you have, uh, you're able to reuse variables where here every time that in the Carpentry compiler you make uh, a change, uh, now all of a sudden uh, these variables are different. They represent different pieces of stock and what you can do them with them is, um, uh, is different. So that's a big challenge. And the other challenge is that we don't have nice synthetic rewrite rules uh, to show equivalences uh, that are common in eGraph applications. We have to look at the geometry and understand, for example, that oh, I can represent uh, making these two parts in the same way of stacking lumber and how, how does that mean? 
so we address these questions uh, by proposing a geometric method to populate and modify these heat graphs uh, by looking at different equivalence choices and pruning possible choices. Um, and so these geometric methods allow us to populate and represent this e-graph. And then oh, once we have an e-graph, the next thing that we need to do is to extract the optimal program, which again, we're going to have to do it in a different way than it's typically done in programming languages, because here we have multiple objectives that we care about that are conflicting. So uh, we, are, uh, we propose also an algorithm uh, based on genetic algorithms uh, that will find the whole Pareto plot. So instead of finding you know, just one uh, single objective, we are going to find uh, multiple, um, uh, we're searching for multiple conflicting objectives. Uh, so here's an example of a result where we are exploring this domain and uh, the uh, output is a set of points in the Pareto plot that then the user can pick and choose how they are going to trade off these objectives uh, to fabricate the part. And here's an example of us actually fabricating one of these designs following these instructions. And you can see that our method works well because if you compare to experts, uh, we actually are able to find designs that behave better than what an expert is able uh, uh, to, uh, to, to define in terms of a fabrication plan. And that is because, as we said, the space is really, really huge and it's hard to search, uh, but uh, using uh, e-graphs, we can search it efficiently. Um, so eight out of our nine experiments, we found a solution that outperforms the expert. And in the other case, we found solutions that just have different types of trade-offs. All right. Um, so now that I uh, mentioned this uh, example, um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, looking forward for other kinds of open problems in the interface of programming languages and geometry processing that I think are interesting to pursue. Um, so the first, um, Application is, of course, um, still looking at this uh, optimization of both design and manufacturing plans. So as I was mentioning, um, it's really exciting to look at what ISAs did uh, for computer systems in terms of uh, decomposing right, or decoupling software and hardware, allowing us to make uh, progress in, in both domains. Um, but there are many important relationships between design and fabrication that constrain how much we can decouple them, right? So for example, when you create a design, right, you typically you have some objectives of how you want this object to behave once it's part of the physical world and that drives the design process. And then once you have this design, you can figure out what's the optimum way to fabricate it by minimizing, for example, the production cost. But of course, the way that you specify the design, right, affects what is the performance of your fabrication, like how much you can optimize the fabrication depends on what initial design you had. And uh, alternatively, uh, create, uh, the fabrication also defines what is it that you can make, the processes that you have available constrain what it is that you can make. And even more than that, right, the fabrication process itself will affect how the design is going to perform. So the behavior of the design, right, uh, depends on, on the fabrication. This is a very uh, classic example for 3D printing where you change the printing direction and all of a sudden the load uh, that this part can take changes significantly. So we really must take manufacturing into account during this, this design process. Um, so uh, looking forward, a couple of uh, things that we're thinking about is, well, can we uh, do joint design and manufacturing optimization uh, with some of these ideas of programming languages? So if I have, for example, the design on the left and I change it ever so slightly, all of a sudden I have the opportunity to create a fabrication plan that is a lot more efficient. So I would like to search both in design and the fabrication uh, um, plan space jointly. 
And it's not just about uh, the fabrication plan, but it, there's also a question on how you schedule uh, the, the plan in the, in, in, the, in the machine. So now imagine that you have a workshop and you have a bunch of different processes, right? How do you allocate these resources in, the, in a good way, right? Uh, so if you have a set of fabrication plans and there is a scheduling problem, but if you have alternatives of different plans for different designs, then again, you have a joint optimization problem. And even uh, outside of manufacturing, if we're thinking about designs as programs, I think that there are still some really interesting questions uh, that are important to ask. And one of them is, how do you write a good program, right? So uh, we were talking about how representing geometry as program is nice because it's compact. Uh, it allows the users to define structure in exactly the way that they want, right? Uh, but writing a program can be challenging, particularly if you're not an expert in programming languages. So automatic ways of defining your programs is really an interesting area of research. Um, and there has been uh, some interesting work in this area. So one is using synthesis to match an input. So this is uh, some of the work that we did a couple of years ago, uh, where you had an input and you're trying to find uh, the CSG uh, tree that would generate uh, that input. And there's been really interesting, also uh, more recent work from other groups that have been uh, also uh, doing this inverse uh, design now using some of the data sets that are available um, from, from the CAD, um, CAD repositories uh, and using machine learning to, to do this inverse uh, model. But in addition to being able to reconstruct a given design, I think that there are many good questions about what is a good program. Right. Uh, so here is an example of uh, exposing the structure of a program. So this is a design and this is a reconstructed uh, program that executes that design. But that program totally obfuscates the fact that there is a replicable pattern here. Right. Uh, but I could do a rewrite and have an equivalent program that now uh, really highlights the, the structure. So this is a recent work that also uses the same idea of e-graphs uh, to do rewrites uh, to generate better programs. Um, so I think that this is a really nice area that requires uh, you know, more thought because also there's a question of what makes a program good, right? And it's also application driven. Another important question is on this analysis of uh, program variation. So we were talking about, well, if you have a good program, you have a good way to represent the structure or how this, uh, this program can change, right? Um, but now if you have a program with a set of variations, how can you explore it and how can you analyze it? Uh, so we have been using in graphics for metric variations to define a search space for optimization for quite some time. Uh, and it really does allow us to define and constrain a space over which we can do shape optimization for many different domains, right? Um, and there are many different ways to create this parametric variation. Typically, we use some nice geometry processing tools like you know, linear blend skinning, cages, offset surface, and so on. Um, and what these tools are really nice is that they uh, give you a way of representing the geometry maybe as a mesh, right? And each vertex of a mesh is a function of these parameters that you can nicely um, represent, differentiate, and so on and so forth to uh, plug into your optimization algorithms. But with CAD pro programs, right, uh, this is not so trivial because in the end of the day, what you have is a program. Every time you change a parameter, you need to recompile, right, to generate a new geometry. And even if the change uh, looks smooth, right, in terms of the final output, the representation can have uh, some important discontinuities. For example, here we're using BRAPs, which are boundary representations used in CAD, and you see how changing a parameter kind of uh, creates discontinuities on the representation. So there has been some work also in trying to optimize and search for CAD programs. Uh, we've done some work in the past uh, by uh, being able to sample this space, creating co uh, shape correspondences locally so that we can do uh, this search. There's also been some really nice work on uh, extended final element methods that will allow us to you know, do physical simulation directly at the intersection between a CAD model and a simulation grid so you don't have to do remeshing all the time. Um, another really nice work just coming out 
um, defines a different uh, a way to uh, does this for images. Uh, so it's a differentiable model um, for programs. Uh, so it defines a differentiable rasterizer here that bridges you know, vector graphics, which is a program uh, to a raster image domain so that operations that you can do in rasterized images can then be applied to the program. Um, okay, so this is a summary of what I wanted to do today. I hopefully managed to tell you a little bit our brief overview about the kind of work that our uh, search group does. Uh, hopefully get you excited about programming languages and applications um, in geometry processing. Um, and then I tried to tell a little bit of a story about a work that we did. So maybe you learned about e-graphs, which are really cool. Uh, and if you're interested, I would encourage you to learn more about them. Uh, and hopefully also mention some cool and interesting ideas for moving forward. And if any of those seem interesting to you, our group is always excited to um, for more collaborations. Uh, so if there's any of these problems that sound exciting, uh, do reach out to us. Um, we are uh, really interested in pursuing some of these ideas. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Joanna and Honglin for this great talks and amazing slides. Thanks so, thanks so much for uh, these question, great questions on the chat. Okay, I'll try to go uh, questions uh, one by one. So for Honglin, um, is there a way that spectral coarsening can be extended to nonlinear operators? For example, the operators that arise from nonlinear finite elements? Yeah, theoretically, it can be extended to nonlinear operators, and that will be a really interesting future works to do. Though the optimization might be a little bit hard due to the nonlinear arities. Yeah, but that must that is definitely an interesting future work to do. Oh, like, uh, and then another question would be then, uh, you can course in any one particular, but is there a way to course in that's valid for a range of deformations? Oh, so like for for the cases that you you course on once and then use it for a range of deformations, currently we may need some recomputations if the deformation is too large. In which case the eigenvectors change a lot, but the good things are currently we are not too slow and we are still faster than the previous work, or we can probably do some pre-computations, but. Definitely, this is also an interesting future work to do. <laughs> oh, and then if, if the deformation is, isn't that large, then you, you can like directly re reuse your uh, the composition. Yeah, as long as the equalizers are still closed. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, a question for Adriana. Uh, this is kind of a long question uh, from the chat. Uh, and. So the questioner is saying that he feels like uh, we have some good language for describing geometry, for example, CAD, triangle meshes, constructive solid geometry, and your listen harm, but poor abstraction for describing function and motion. It seems an important next step is to develop a language for describing function with, with a compound which can map function program to low level fabrication uh, domain specific language. Sorry, I muted. Uh, yeah, that, that, that is a great uh, area of future work. Um, if you think about, for example, in robotics, right, uh, function can also be, you know, code. <laughs> and uh, there's, so, so there's some languages, right, so like, that tell you how, you know, the code that you put in a microcontroller, right, is a function or in terms of like the gate of that robot. Um, but it's uh, very low level. So yes, coming up with good DSLs uh, that could uh, represent, uh, you know, some functionality or if you mean by function also performance, right, or how an object uh, behaves in terms of its stability, its durability, uh, right. Uh, so that was, you know, definitely a good area of future work um, that would allow some optimization. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Oh, I think then I, uh, that um, automatically could uh, lead to another follow-up question, which is, uh, sorry, it's just this, um, so like, do you think uh, other industries like architecture construction will benefit from uh, your new uh, domain specific language? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, all of these applications are uh, important for uh, domains like architecture. Um, and particularly, like, um, it's also interesting, to, uh, another interesting problem is to think about, uh, like we create these languages and this is a process and then you say, okay, now go and execute, right? But especially in architecture, if you think about uh, big projects, right? Um, they're constantly having to change the geometry and update, right, as problems arise. Um, so a good interface to do that, right? So uh, in the construction site, right, you can update your model and your design is extremely, extremely valuable. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting uh, direction. Uh, thank you, thank you for answering that. Um, uh, and another question for Hong Lin. Um, does, does, does your surface to volume technique mean that uh, we don't need to do a tap meshing anymore? Well, it's, it's like right now, it's our initial attempt to do the volume to surface approximation. So right now, we still need the Laplace at the ego vector of the test mesh in our optimization. Although the final course operator, they can serve as a volumetric operator in independently. But it would be also an interesting future work to the, use our method as a possible way to generate training data to find the best sparsity pattern without the presence of the volumetric mesh. So we can probably, maybe in the future, we don't need time mesh anymore, but right now, I guess we still need it. <laughs> Right, um, got it. Um, for a question for the Adriana, um, what, what can be done if the pricing design is itself very costly? The questioner have a hard, hard in some setting that you might need to pay someone a quite amount of money to spend hours to determine how much a design costs to make. So say just the beginning of the question again, if what can be done if the, if oh, yeah if the pricing design it is itself very costly? Oh, the, yes. Um, well, that's a good question, right? Um, so, I, and it's uh, a really important question, right? Like if uh, design, so design is expensive, right? Um, so uh, you spend a lot of uh, effort, right? And uh, in companies spend a lot of uh, uh, time and money creating good designs, right? And then you do you know, batch production. Uh, part of the need of, or the interest in lowering the cost of design and uh, by making it more efficient, right? And by creating design tools that allow us to search the space efficiently, right? Is exactly enabling this kind of, uh, not even batch of one, but a small batch production, right? Uh, and that is important both in terms of the design and also generating the fabrication plans because there's a huge cost, right? Uh, in optimizing uh, the fabrication plans. Um, so yeah, so if the design, uh, if the cost of design is uh, is large, right, then typically you, like, you have to, you know, trade off, right, what is important. Um, and also if, uh, you know, optimization takes a very long time, and maybe uh, that is more expensive. So uh, if you're only going to do, you know, one single design, and it, you know, it's very expensive to generate the uh, the perfect manufacturing plan, uh, then you maybe prefer to, you know, do the suboptimal one. Uh, and you can also take, uh, uh, do, you know, part of the optimization, like uh, take that into account as well, right? Uh, decide where you want to be suboptimal uh, so that you can, um, uh, if, if that uh, time is also uh, taken into account in your total cost. So when you do it jointly. Okay, got it, got it. Oh, thank you. Um... Actually, there's a lot of questions from Adriana that's constantly coming from YouTube chat. Um, okay, so and then, uh, w what are the key challenges uh, to popularize this program language in practice? What do you think? Oh, sorry, Adriana, you, I think you're muted. Sorry, uh, key challenges to to do what? Uh, key challenges to popularize uh, this program program language in practice. Um. So. Um... Uh, so the uh, key challenges to, well, uh, I think one of the issues, uh, and I think it's something that at least uh, my collaborators in Cal are trying uh, to do very much, is um, do, for each application, uh, what we need are DSLs, right, domain-specific languages. And uh, domain-specific languages are actually most like 
the best ones out there. Or like, you know, so I don't want to make strong claims, but good domain specific languages are really generated by domain experts, not PL experts. Um, but when we can go in and create a domain specific language, but then we want to plug that into a, a compiler to an optimizer and so on and so forth, right? But then in order to do that now, for example, for eGraphs, we need to you know, design a rewrite rule, right? Uh, for each of those things. Um, so a lot of, I think there's a lot of interesting questions that programming languages go make that would tell you, well, you know, now you can plug in your DSL, right? And I can, for any DSL, be able to, uh, you know, do synthesis, do compilation and so on and so forth. Now <laughs> there's no free lunch. Right, uh, because all of these uh, techniques are going to end up being expensive because you know they're not using uh, the understanding of the domain to make a better optimization. Uh, so I think those are the challenges, and I think uh, that's uh, those two. Uh, these advances need to kind of go hand in hand, right? Like create general purpose programming languages tools that allow you to create more DSLs and plug and play, uh, and then have a way to then as a as up and after fast optimized, right, for those specific languages that end up being useful. Got it, got it. Um, thank you so much. Um, there's a little bit more uh, technical question from the chat. Uh, he's actually quite an uh, a expert on differentiating things. So he's asking that what are the key challenges, I mean, sorry, have people tried to differentiate to differentiable modeling to optimize CAD model parameters for design objectives? Uh, there's some work in um, uh, different, so uh, in differentiating uh, programs. Uh, so yeah, this is this is definitely a really <laughs> nice area of, of research. Uh, so differential programming is is an, is an important area in programming languages and different ways uh, to do this, uh, right? Um, so um, yeah, I actually am, am happy to chat more of, of, about this offline because we're something we're kind of actively uh, <laughs> uh, been uh, been thinking about. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think you you enjoy to talk about one of our hosts, uh, the Drake. Uh, he's quite an expert in this area. So uh, and then uh, just one more, I think one more question from the chat would be, uh, would you would your method work to find an optimal geometric configuration for designing? Glass or metal ceilings? Um, no, like our um, this 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 model uh, is finding the optimal fabrication plans, uh, but not uh, still not jointly optimized in the design, so it wouldn't find the optimal design. Uh, though that is definitely an area of future work that we're excited about. Got it. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think for today, um, we're happy to, I think we're all, we've always felt sorry that we were always uh, extending our time uh, too much. So I think for this week, uh, we can wrap up this precisely around one hour. So thank you so much uh, for coming this colloquium. Let's thank our speakers again. Uh, we want to mention that uh, the great poster for this week is designed by the artist uh, Vienna Mestri. And also stay tuned to next week where we're going to discuss Neural Networks on Geometry by Thomas Davis and Brajmar Kim. So, and see you all next week.